Well, everybody, we're back again on Rapid Chats with Angus. And today I have another very, very special guest. The first Springbok to feature on the show in Ryan Kankowski. Ryan, very, very welcome to my show. Thank you for having me, Angus. Appreciate it. Now, thanks for your time. Um, I know you've been, uh, you've been quite a uh, rush to get to this interview today, but um, at least you made it, eh? <laughs> no worries, no. It's just Joburg traffic. It's never easy. Yeah, eh? You probably missed Durban for those kind of things, eh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, like, uh, the thing is, like, um, many of the guests on the show, um, they've had quite a rapid journey. But unlike them, you also managed to rack up 100 plus caps for one team. We all started for you at the Sharks. Coming from the Eastern Cape, how did the opportunity present itself to join the Durban based franchise? Um, so I went to a school, St. Andrews College in Grahamstown. Mm -hmm. um, and we took part in a yearly competition up at St. Stithian's Rugby Festival. And the one year when I was playing, um, a guy by the name of Hans Gruber approached me. He used to run, I'm not sure if he's still involved with the Sharks Academy in Durban. And they offered, you know, a complete package, you know, come study, come play, um, and, you know, do the complete approach, you know. Um, and, you know, my parents kind of living an hour outside of Durban, it made sense to come up that side. You know, loving the Sharks is also, at that point, it made sense to me, you know, to come up there and, you know, come give it a go. So it was... Yeah, it was pretty simple at that stage, you know, and, and unfortunately it, it all worked out. That's always a good thing when that happens, eh? But yeah. in 2006, uh, your senior career started by playing in the Curry Cup. It didn't go all that smooth. You joined the Blitzbox uh, for a couple of months after that. But in 2007, that was the magical breakthrough year for you, one could say. And you appeared in the first ever, and still the only one after the, well, actually the first ever only, um, also at African Super 14 final that year. And you went to make your debut for the Springboks on the end of your tour. Super 12, wasn't it? Wasn't it yeah. Super 12 then? <laughs> no, it was Super 14, Super 14. I think Super 12 started in 2000 or ended in 2006. Yeah. In the Cheetahs uh, Yeah, I'm not sure. I think it was Super 12 still. Super... Yeah, it could be Super 14. I don't know, man. Yeah. You're probably right. Yeah, yeah, I remember the old, uh, the old jersey with the Super 14 logo yes. on the side. Yeah, that's how I saw it. Yes, yes, yes. Remember that. Um, but in any case, at the end of your tour, you were selected to tour with the Springboks and you make your debut against Wales. And not just yes. making your debut, you actually scored on debut. How would you describe yes. this whole experience to play for your country for the first time? It was a you know, bit of a whirlwind you know, um, experience, because I was down in Cape Town on holiday, not expecting to join the box at all. Mm. You know, they're getting a phone call there while you're out with your friends, getting told you have to get on a plane the next morning, eight o'clock, and be ready to fly out, you know, so it was quite a, a shock surprise. Um, I probably didn't believe it till I actually got to Joburg and, and, you know, met the team, you know, they came straight out of winning the World Cup, you know, so it was quite a, a special team to be a part of. And mm. You know, the, the rugby, it was crazy, you know, you can't even, it was like a blur, you know, I can remember scoring, I remember, you know, making times off the field, but, you know, that whole game was a massive blur. It's just, yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah, like we always say, I've spoke to a couple of guys before and they said to me that the first match um, in any competition, you know, whether for the box or a Curry Cup match or Super Rugby, it always goes by so quickly and they don't remember much of it, only like, Spits and pieces here and there, like a good night yeah. out. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, let's go back to that Super 14 final. And um, many, especially Sharks fans, feel it was the proverbial one that got away for the Sharks team. You know, when Brian Banner snatched the trophy away, you know, with that, that dramatic late score in a match that many still describe as one of the best finals of the whole competition, you know, stretching through, through the 25 years. How tough yes. was that book? That pull to swallow, you know, basically after having one hand on the trophy. And um, what lessons did you take <laughs> out of that, you know, that um, taught you anything going further in your career? You know, it was really tough. It was a really tough pull to swallow, you know, because um, I think I substituted those last like 10 minutes, you know, so we were obviously there on the sideline watching it happen, you know, um, so it's even tougher not actually being able to do anything to try and stop it. Um, but 
you know, you forget about it. You know, the next year, Curry Cup, we end up winning the Curry Cup, you know. So it was made up a bit, you know, for the for the, the sorrow and the loss. But, um, you know, I'd say you don't really hang on to that. You know, it's, it's there, it's in the back of your mind, but then it's on to the next one and on to the next one. Uh, so that's kind of what you're preparing for. It's never really, you can't really afford to hang on to that loss. I think the next day or that week, it was quite sore. But then after that, you're on to the next competition and, you know, just moving forward. Yeah, you, you spoke about something now that made me think of a certain image, and that was um, John Smith's reaction on the sidelines, you know, with his hair in his hand in his hair and thinking, oh, damn, I can't do anything about this when Brian just scored. So yes. I can, I can get the, the sentiment you, you sort of saying there, because if no, you were on the field, you think maybe I could have made that tackle, I could have been in that position to stop you know, any sort of play that happens. So yes, it is quite a... Watching, you just, yeah. It's one of those things you just have to... <laughs> yeah, you, you can't agree with anybody. Can <laughs> yeah. But you mentioned this, you know, in 2008, um, you won the Curry Cup. And in that season, you were nominated as one of the competition's players of the year. You also won it, like I said, against the Bulls, which is always cool because they were dominant in that period. Um, yes. And many say, you know, that the competition has been watered down in recent years and, you know, the box not playing in the competition up until now, you know, due to COVID. Um, and, um, and although we see them, you know, involved in this period, uh, do you think that is the case where since 2014 up until now that the competition has been watered down or do you think it actually provided a platform for young talent to actually come through and play through the whole competition? Because um, if you think back to the day, um, I think when you were youngster as well, you would probably play in the Curry Cup, and then a Springbok would come in and take your place. And you fought with that team to get to the semis or the finals. No, but you know, they earned that right. Mm. You know, you were part of the team the whole time. You went to the box and then, you know, you earned the right to come back. It might not be fair, but it happened to me. It will happen to players going forward. Um, you know, if you want to hold on to that jersey, you know, you need to play well. So not everyone came back and just went straight in. There was a handful of guys. And yeah, it was a tough pull to swallow, but it is what it is. And, and regarding watering it down, I'd say, I don't think the comp's so watered down. Um, I think it's just too much rugby, you know, because previously you had one super rugby game against the Bulls and it was either in Joburg or we'll call it Pretoria or Durban, you know. So every single supporter went to go and watch one of those games. You drove across the country. It was... They were massive spectacles, you know, same as Curry Cup. You might have had a home and away game then, but there are only three games a year. Now it's, there's so much rugby, you know. So um, I think that's what's kind of killing it a bit. You know, when you get too much, you, people stop traveling, people stop watching this because it's, oh, it's the same game. Uh, so, you know, I think they need to try and find that mix. You know, obviously the rugby guys won't say anything because you just want to play as much as possible. You know, you just want to get on the field and play, play, play. But, you know, I think if they want to kind of bring back that special feeling behind the games, those massive derbies, you know, you've got to have one game, um, winner takes all, not three games a season. You should never be playing a team, you know, three times in the same competition. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. But... Yeah, otherwise I still think it's a great competition. It gives a lot of youngsters um, a great opportunity to come through and test themselves out. Uh, and now who knows what's going to happen with the different comps. Where are we going? UK, I don't know. So it's a testing time. So I think Curry Cup will be very, excuse me, very important, you know, during this time um, until we do sort out where we're going. Mm, so you actually mentioned a few things now that made me think a bit. I think uh, I read a couple of weeks ago that um, the Rapid Championship, with the, um, the other three nations, you know, the Aussies and the Kiwis yes, yes, yes. and the Aussies. They're actually thinking of going back to a single round again um, because they, it used to be like that and then they expanded it to a double round. I think that was in yes. the late 2010s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so we had one round, uh, yeah, it was probably yeah. until 2011, 2012, somewhere there. Mm. And then yeah. they went to, to the double. One round, yes, you had one round mm. home and away, or home or away. Um, but that's what made it special, you know, you knew it was, yeah, that's what kind of, just one game, you know, now it's your pool game and then, I don't know, it's got way too complicated. Um, yeah, and we've also seen a lot, um, 
like where you play, like you mentioned now in the Curry Cup, for instance, you would play a team home and away, and um, you would beat them twice, perhaps. You know, you beat them and then you, you beat them, them away. Yeah, <laughs> but, but now you come into a knockout game and you have this thing at the back of your mind, okay, we beat them there twice, we should beat them again. You know, that's just human yes. nature. And then on the day they surprise you, and it's kind of unfair, you would say, because you already beat them twice. Why do you have to no, go play knockout, against them knockout. again? Yeah, yeah that's, knockouts, knockouts. So knockouts, you knockouts. Can't yeah. Really, yeah, you know, going into it, you know, before the game, it's it's knockout. So, you know, if you're a team and you lose that game, that's only on you. Because mm. if you've beaten them twice already, then you should know how to beat them a third time. <laughs> um, but you should never be playing them two times in the season. You know, that's the thing. Mm. That's it. Should be one game, then you can get into playoff stages, and then it's you know it's fair game, but. You know, when you play too much against the same team, it just becomes a bit boring for people watching. Yeah. And um, I mean, I love to watch rugby a lot, but even after a while, I'll get bored as well, you know, if I have to see the same no, team over and over again. You do. Yeah. Um, but now, some exciting stuff coming up next year, God willing, if everything goes well. We talk about yeah. the British and Irish Lions tour um, to South Africa, and you were part of the team or you were part of the last team that could, they couldn't win a series against, you know, you guys beat them two to one. Um, yes. What do you think the chances are of the Lions managing to right the wrongs, you can say, um, of 2009? Um, I think this is probably their best chance, you know, they, they are playing against the, the brilliant Springbok team um, and some brilliant players, you know, I think they definitely will all want to put up their hands and have a massive performance. But I think they might be a bit undercooked, you know, um, not having test match rugby, you know, I think Rusty will come up with some plan to try and get them some game time. You know, maybe they'll play Springboks against the rest of South Africa, you know, do some cool games to, to give them some proper competition before that. Um, but, yeah, I'd say because we are a bit undercooked, I think it's probably their best, their best chance to get a result. But, you know, the Springboks, you know, it's a, it's a special team. You know, you aren't one of the best teams in the world for nothing. And the guys will step up. Um, you know, I know them, I know a lot of them personally, and they'll be extremely hungry and just loving the opportunity to put that jersey on again and, you know, show the people out there that they deserve to, to wear it. Yeah, I think uh, the Argentinians probably debunked all most of being undercooked because um, what they did <laughs> in, the, in the rugby championship. I don't think anyone gave them a chance. I remember I was covering that game um, between them and All Blacks, the one that um, they beat All Blacks. And during my build-up, yes. so I do the text commentary, and in the build-up, they I normally do a prediction at the end, just before the match starts. And I said, um, the Argies will be in the fight for the first 40 minutes, but I think the All Blacks will run away with it in the second 40 and beat them by 30. I was wrong on so many levels. When I said <laughs> that. <laughs> Listen, so, there's um, certain teams... There's certain teams and you play them in their country, they, it's a different beast, you know, if you don't smack them very early on and, you know, put them in that little box, they mm. are going to be there the whole game. And, you know, I think the All Blacks went in a bit easy yeah. and they let the Aussies get up. And then once they're up, it's almost impossible to stop them. You know, they, they're an extremely passionate nation. Um, so once they get going, it's, yeah, they're a hell of a force to stop. Yeah, definitely, man. But um, being part of that Lions tour, how special was it for you? It was unbelievable. You know, it's, it's a, there's a massive amount of people that come into the country. You know, every restaurant, every pub, just walking on the street, you know, there's a massive vibe that, you know, all those countries bring into South Africa. So, you know, I think, you know, for those players that will be involved, you know, at club level, um, you know, the unions, the Sharks, whoever they're playing, uh, when they do get a chance to play. And, you know, especially the Springboks, you know, enjoy it. Uh, it's uh, it's literally comes around once every 12 years. So to be a part of it is is something, you know, it's, it's way more rare than a World Cup. You know, it's, it's, it's something really cool. And, you know, just enjoy it. Take it and enjoy every second of it. Are you saying something that Peter Steph also mentioned? He said to himself, it's bigger than the World Cup. Um, and I probably think, yeah. don't think in the, in the sense of, um, you know, I think winning the World Cup is the pinnacle of everyone's career. But if you can beat the Lions, it's also right up there. So I, I kind of oh, you know, get his sentiment. There are a couple teams in one. They, there's some really 
brilliant players and I think they you know they love this tour you know it's one of the I think it, I think it is the oldest tour you know around so it is it's, it is it's something extremely special and you know I think yeah it's just it's going to be unbelievable to to watch I hope it does go ahead um and you know just to be around watching at the stadiums you know even if you just get close and watch in a pub nearby there are a lot of people that can't get tickets and they'll be around and it'll just be one of the, a brilliant vibe around the whole tour yeah, I think I'm one of the lucky ones to actually be able to go to all three t- test matches and the Stormers game yes. as well. So, yeah, I got, I got a couple of buddies in Joburg organized me tickets for um, for both tests. And all the extras I got, I, you know, gave them to the to the Cape Town um, game. I gave that to them. So we did a bit of a swap. So it all worked yes. out in the end. Um, but I'm looking awesome. forward to it, you know, hoping that it no, goes it's, forward. It's, it's something really special and, yeah, I cherish every second. Definitely. Um, but also, we fast forward to 2009, where it's been the year of the Springbok, one can say. You managed to whitewash the All Blacks by beating them three times in one year. I think that's the last time anything like that ever happen, happened, by the way. It, it's yeah. still a standing record, and uh, you also won the Tri-Nations. Can you perhaps give a bit of insight um, as to how the celebrations and all-around feeling were after that massive achievement? I'm talking about talking out of the change room now. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, it was massive. I actually remember that the party afterwards. Um, I can't mention too much, but there was lots of fun in the hotel. You know, I don't think any person left the hotel. Um, we had our own little contiki, a little private party with the whole team in our, you know, the one room, a bit of a fines meeting. Oh, yeah. And the guys sat there, and yes, see, some of us, you know, sat there till three, four o'clock in the morning, you know, just chatting away um you know, it was really special and you know that team had a lot of great friends you know we a massive bunch of friends and yeah it was unbelievable yeah it sounds like a good night out there even though you were in the hotel <laughs> like any night no, that goes yeah, past three o'clock is a beauty <laughs> <laughs> was brilliant. It, was, it was it was so much fun you know the guys got out of hand but behaved behaved we all made it to the plane and we all got a yeah, it's all that matters, eh? Yes. Then, um, <laughs> then after your, your Springbok career, or you were still a Springbok, obviously, but um, you also had two Japanese stints, one with the Yota Shuttles and then with the Red Hurricanes, respectively. How did you find the Japanese culture and the quality of rugby at the point in time when you went over? Um, well, in the beginning, I'd say you know, the rugby wasn't the best. You know, it was a lot of fun. It was like schoolboy rugby. Mm. You know, lots of fun attacking rugby. Um, you know, there was no, I wouldn't say plan, you know, but it was always scoring tries, making rugby look good, you know, appealing to everyone. You know, then again, Toyota Industries, um, we were a second of team and, you know, they were like bottom tier, second, second tier team, you know. So when we got there, it was, I think we were like four or five professional players um, and the rest were like factory workers, you know, employees in Toyota. So then, you know, we won the promo that year, then we went up to top league and, you know, we slowly built up, you know, and every year the team got better and better. The players just wanted to learn, you know, every single thing, you know, whether it was a passing drill you were doing, a warm up, stepping, they were always watching, always, you know, willing to learn. And, you know, they turned out to be a brilliant team. You know, they, they really do, when they put their minds to actually learning and getting better, it's, it's an amazing country, you know, how the people work. Um, by the time we left, you know, we were, again, a mid-table team in, in top league, you know, and then my last stint at Red Hurricanes, you know, NTT Docomo was, um, was awesome, a bigger South African contingent there. And, you know, I thought we played some brilliant rugby, you know, the, the results, I think it's still the best that team's ever done, even though the guys got relegated, you know, they came up with a new system where one side didn't play against the other side and, you know, two teams ended up playing and like you said, you beat them the whole time and it came to a promo relegation and a few injuries before the comp, you end up losing the game and get demoted. But you had more team, more points than a team in the opposite. It's just weird, mm-hmm. like how it worked. But I'd say that is probably some of my best rugby, you know, playing there in Japan. Uh, there's lots of fun and as a nation, they really are amazing. Uh, in everything they do, friendly, professional, 
So it was a great time. Awesome, man. You made me think of something when you, you mentioned it now, um, how they started off with, um, with the rugby not being so much, uh, you can say, structured. It was very unstructured, you said. Yes. I think maybe that was the draw card. They wanted to, to start off, not get too serious, get people to actually enjoy the sport. And then once they're into it, then, you know, make it a bit more professional, learn a bit more and get the structures into place. And then with those of the World Cup, um, they made the quarterfinal. So it worked out very well for them, actually, if you think about it. Yes. Yeah, I was unluckily. I was in Japan when they beat us that last World Cup. Um, it wasn't fun, you know. Um, and that's the type of nation they are. You know, if you tell them you will win if you train like this, they will train like that and more. You know, they more is better. It's like that old samurai way, you know, you do it a thousand or ten thousand times, you'll perfect it. And that's just the culture, you know, they it's work, 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 you know, and then you know, it paid off for them. You know, they really are like phenomenal. Um and they're just getting better and better. You can see with their performances from that last win against us, you know, to this last World Cup, you know, they played better rugby than most teams, you know, they, with the kind of players they have, you know, they don't have the, it's going to be ugly to say, they don't have the calibre of an Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, England, mm. you know, just size-wise and stuff, but they've got, you know, massive heart um, and players that play way out of what you think they could play, you know, and as a team, they, you know, they put up their hands and they, you know, play with everything they have and, you know, I think they're just going to keep getting better and better. Yeah, and I think about um, that quarterfinal that we had against them. I mean, we were only two points ahead, five three at a point in time. Yes. That's how that's how big they pushed us, and they yes. even managed to to I wouldn't call it an upset now anymore because I think they're actually a damn good side. They they beat Ireland, yes. they beat Scotland. That, yes. that is no mean feat. So um, yes. I actually tell people this when they tell me, yeah, the box got lucky to play Japan in the quarterfinal. They got the easy route. They weren't an easy team to play. We were no. And no. the first half, and we actually came to our right in the second. So they are a never growing nation. I think they'll become very much top tier side very, very soon. Yes, no, definitely. I agree with you. I think they have become a top 10 team now, mm. um, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, they, they, they're brilliant. And now they've got, I think Dave, is it Dave, not Dave Rennie? Who is the, um, the guy think, in New Zealand coach? I now. think Jamie Joseph is still involved. Jamie with Joseph. Yes, yeah. Jamie Joseph. So, that, you know, they're they, they bringing him some serious brain power in rugby, you know. So, he's come in there, he'll set up some serious um, structure in their whole game and, you know, give them the ability to just grow this game, you know. It's, it's, it's a very young sport in Japan. Not that many people play it. I think it's like fifth or fourth choice wow. in the country. Yeah, no, it's not. You know, they're an American sport, you know, nation, you know, basketball, softball, mm. Um, a lot of those things are way more popular than um, and soccer, way more popular than than rugby. So I think it's slowly that win against us those couple of years back definitely kickstarted the sport, and you know they're just growing every year. Oh, definitely. Um, 2017, you had a short stint with the Golden Lions. I didn't saw that coming, yes. by the way. <laughs> and you even ended up captaining captaining them in the Curry Cup. How did that move come about? Um, it's quite funny actually. So, you know, Rudolf Strali was involved at the Sharks mm. for many years. Swayze the Brain, the head coach at the, during the Curry Cup, um, he actually coached me under 20 at the Sharks. And then Altman Allers, who's involved with the Lions, you know, um, he came to me, I met him, I've known him for many years, and he always said to me, Ryan, you owe me a season at the Lions. So, you know, when the opportunity came about, um, you know, it just made sense. You know, I knew most of the people behind the scenes. Um, and, you know, I came there, they were a very young side. I think, you know, the Curry Cup was basically under 21 players. You know, so I thought I'd just come and, you know, try and help where I can and, you know, give maybe a season, you know, a season or two um, to the Lions and, and have some fun. You know, it was, it was, they're playing some brilliant rugby. They've got some brilliant coaches and brilliant players, you know, from, under 19, right up to, to the main side, you know, that they've created a really special culture at the Lions. And, you know, I loved every second of it. You know, I'm still really friendly with a lot of those guys. And it was only six months, you know, like spending time with them. So, 
you know, and being based up in Joburg now, it's, it's really cool. So, um, you know, they're a special team and, you know, I really expect some, some really special things from them going forward. Well, they beat us last weekend, so yeah, I'm still a bit miffed about that. I support Provence, <laughs> no, by the way. They work really hard, so. <laughs> yeah, um, really yeah, you are also an avid gamer, but your yes. field of the rugby is property development. That's correct, eh? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. How are you enjoying it? And would you advise current players to start a career for life after rugby, if possible, during their playing days or after? Um, I think they need to do it before they even start playing rugby, is start setting yourself up for after. Mm. Um, you know, I was very fortunate when I just started, I had a, a player, Warren Britt, take me around and he showed me a lot of old players' houses, you know, that they used to own. Mm. And, um, you, and you know, then I ask, obviously, why? What do you mean they used to own? He says, well, they, they all spent basically every cent of money on these houses and your rugby career is only 10 years long. And if you're lucky, yeah. And a bond takes 20 years to pay off, you know, so you've spent every cent trying to pay up a house that you will never be able to pay off. Um, and they end up selling it and never actually making money with the money they earned. So it kind of set off alarm bells, you know, so for me it was always, by the time I'm finished rugby, I want to have X amount of money in my bank account or, you know, have properties or just something going that I can walk straight out of rugby into being okay after rugby. So it kind of set off a chain of events that um, you know, got me involved in property. It was the I would say simplest thing. You know, I was always warned of getting into coffee shops and businesses because you have to be there 24 seven to kind of make sure, you know, no one steals anything. Um, or, you know, just, you know, you need to be involved. You know, otherwise mm -hmm. things go missing. People don't care about your business as much as you would care about it. So, you know, it, it, yeah, so I got involved in that and, you know, while I was in Japan, you know, for six years, I kind of set myself up trying to invest in small property developments here and there and, you know, flip them, keep on or two. You know, at the moment, I just spent time managing, you know, what's happening. And, you know, luckily I got, I didn't do anything new going into COVID. Um, so I wasn't kind of sitting with a massive debt situation. You had to pay things off while, you know, this is all going on. It's crazy. So... Um, you know, I was quite fortunate. A lot of my stuff worked out and, you know, if, if there is one player that learns something, it's just, you know, rugby is very short. You think you're the, the king, you know, you think nothing will happen to you and tomorrow you could walk across the road, get hit by a car. You could be jogging on the side of the road and twist your ankle and never run again. You know, it's, it's, things have happened. You know, I've seen yeah. it happen to players where they're running on a field and, you know, they step in a hole and tear everything off in their knee. And that's their rugby finished. And, you know, they're young, they're 21, think they've got their whole careers ahead of them. You know, so I'd say study what you can, you know, try and save as much as possible. And, you know, prepare for life after rugby because it happens a lot quicker than you think. Definitely. And, um, you know, it's funny you say that. My dad always tells me, or he told me before, um, go into property. Don't buy a car. A car is not an investment. A property is value no. will always go up, but a car, as soon as you go car, to the showroom, that's so 10k you... down the road. No, so, it's um... not even 10. It's way more than that. Of the car. It's like, <laughs> it's crazy. You know, you, you see so many guys buying these nice car after nice car, and before you know it, they owe 500 grand because they've been rolling cars. Mm. And by the time they finish, they don't even have, they don't even own their own house yet. You know, so, you know, you don't have to buy the biggest house, buy a small apartment, you know, live in a one bed apartment, you know, then once that's kind of, you've got past the halfway mark or a third mark and you can rent it out for more than what your installments are, then, you know, look at getting another one, you know, that's how you start. And then before you know it, you could get the right property in the right place and you double your money, you know? Um, yeah. So, yeah, you know, if anyone learns anything, just, save um look for opportunities and just don't waste and expect it just to be a never-ending thing because you go from earning what they earn to zero after rugby it doesn't keep coming in mm -hmm. so you know think about it a lot earlier than you'd expect yeah it's definitely not a, um, a bottomless pit eh? and um i didn't prep this question but now i actually think about it do you think there should be more education done you know to rugby players especially the youngsters you know from under 16 onwards to say listen um 
you know, the Varsity Cup is a good competition where they don't allow you to play if you don't have a certain pass mark. But do you think there should be more education done on informing these kids, listen, it's not going to be all shining stars and, you know, hot girls and Definitely. fancy cars. <laughs> you have to actually prep yourself for life going forward. Definitely. I think guys definitely have to, to try and find something. It's just difficult, you know, those youngsters, they don't want to learn. Mm. They don't want you to come and tell them what to do with their money, how to live their lives, you know. Um, it's, you know, out of a 50, group of 50 people, you might get one or two that want to actually listen and, you know, want your advice, you know. So um, if there are any guys out there that do need help, you know, get hold of me on anything, get hold of any of the older guys, they'd be more than willing to kind of help the guys out with some advice. Um, you know, it might not be perfect advice, but it's experience. You know, we've, mm -hmm. we've all gone through it. You've, you've done it and, you know, if we can't help you, we'll know someone that might be able to help. So, you know, it's always tough, um, you know, after rugby and, you know, I think young guys must get hold of older players, try and get some advice. And hopefully the unions will start using the, you know, the ex players for those things, you know, set up, you know, events, Clinic. prize, yeah. you know, drinks, or just, you know, social events where they can meet guys and mingle and, you know, bounce questions off them. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a tough time for a lot of players, you know, if they haven't kind of prepared for it or if they end up getting injured and getting kicked out a lot earlier than they expected. And especially now with the whole COVID situation as well, eh? Oh. It's crazy. But um, anyway, I don't want to keep you up for too long. This is the last question. No way. Cool. <laughs> um, are there any possibilities that you will start coaching perhaps at a school level um, or do anything to stay involved with the sport? Um, I definitely think so. You know, I think my, I loved, you know, trying to help guys out, um, especially when they needed it, you know, so probably schoolboy. I might try and get involved. Um, I don't know about the high up, you know, the guys know everything. They don't want to learn anything. So <laughs> I'll probably try, I'll probably go to school where level and, you know, try and make a difference. And especially with people that need it, you know, so, mm -hmm. you know, it's been, yeah, who knows? We'll see. I think sometime soon. Yeah, awesome, man. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll keep, um, I'll keep an eye out on your, on your um, plans going forward. So um, yeah, I hope you do it actually. Thank cause you. Play experience is everything. And I think if uh, a guy can be coached by a former Springbok, even better, you know. But um, well, Ryan, thanks, thanks so very much for your time. Um, I really appreciate it. And guys, that is the, the interview with Ryan Kankowski. Um, I gave the people a couple of clues on my page and a few got it right and a few thought it was Kwaka. They thought it was Kabamba Flowers. <laughs> Not many thought it was you, to be honest. So um, there you have it, guys. It's, it is um, Ryan Kankowski. Kanko, thanks again for your time, man. Um, and I hope um, everything that you plan going forward um, is going well. And so um, have a good day. Thank you so much. Keep well. Cheers, man. Bye-bye. Cheers, bro. Cheers, Angus. Keep well.